Yeah, you said that we're very far away from AGI. I want to eliminate the phrase AGI. <laughs> so uh, b- basically, when you're analyzing large language models and seeing how far are they from whatever AGI is, and we can talk about different right. notions of intelligence that we s- we're not as close as kind of uh, some people in, in, in public view are talking about. So what's your intuition behind that? My intuition is basically that artificial intelligence is different than human intelligence. And so the mistake that is being made by focusing on AGI among those who do is an artificial agent, as we can make them now or in the near future, might be way better than human beings at some things, way worse than human beings at other things. And rather than trying to ask how close is it to being a human-like intelligent, we should appreciate it for what its capabilities are. And that will both be more accurate and help us put it to work and protect us from the dangers better, rather than always anthropomorphizing it. I think the underlying idea there under the definition of AGI is that the capabilities are extremely impressive. (laughs) That's not a precise statement, but me- No, I get that. I completely agree. And then the underlying question where a lot of the debate is, is how impressive is it? What are the limits of large language models? Can they really do things like common sense reasoning? How much do they really understand about the world? Or are they just fancy mimicry machines? Mm -hmm. And uh, where do you fall on that as to the limits of large language models? I don't think that there are many limits in principle. I, I am not, I'm a physicalist about consciousness and awareness and things like that. I see no obstacle to, in principle, building an artificial machine that is indistinguishable in thought and cognition from a human being. But we're not trying to do that, right? What a large language model is trying to do is to predict text. That's what it does. And it is leveraging the fact that we human beings, for very good evolutionary biology reasons, attribute intentionality and intelligence and agency to things that act like human beings. As I was driving here to get to this podcast space, I was using Google Maps, and Google Maps was talking to me, but I wanted to stop to get a cup of coffee, so I didn't do what Google Maps told me to do. I went around a block that it didn't like, and so it it gets annoyed, right? It, it says like, no, why are you doing it? It doesn't say exactly in this, but you know what I mean. It's like, no, turn left, turn left, and you turn right. Yeah. It is impossible as a human being not to feel a little bit sad that Google Maps is getting mad at you. <laughs> it's not. It's not even trying to. It's not a large language model. It's not it has no aspirations to intentionality, but we attribute that all the time. Dan Dennett, the philosopher, wrote a very influential paper on the intentional stance. The fact that it's the most natural thing in the world for we human beings to attribute more intentionality to artificial things than are really there, which is not to say it can't be really there, but if you're trying to be rational and clear thinking about this, the first step is to recognize our huge bias towards attributing things below the surface to systems that are enable that are able to, at the surface level, act human. So if that huge bias of intentionality is there in the data, in the human data, in the vast landscape of human data that AI models, large language models, and video models in the future are trained on, uh, don't you think that that intentionality will emerge as fundamental to the behavior of these systems naturally? I Well, I don't think it will happen naturally. I think it could happen. Again, I'm not against the the principle, but... Again, the way that large language models came to be and what they're optimized for is wildly different than the way that human beings came to be and what they're optimized for. So I think we're missing a chance to be much more clear-headed about what large language models are by judging them against human beings, again, both in positive ways and negative ways. Well, I I think sort of to push back on what they're optimized for is different to describe how they're trained versus what they're optimized for. So they're trained in this very trivial way of predicting text tokens. Mm -hmm. 
but you can describe what they're optimized for and what the actual task in hand is, is to construct a world model, meaning an understanding of the world. And that's where it starts getting closer to what humans are kind of doing. We're just, in the case of large language models, know how the sausage is made, and we don't know how it's made for us humans. But they're not optimized for that. They're optimized to sound human. That's the fine tuning. But the actual training is optimized for understanding, uh, c creating a compressed representation right. of all the stuff that humans have created on the internet. And the hope is that that gives you a deep understanding of the world. Yeah, so that's why I think that there's a set of hugely interesting questions to be asked about the ways in which large language models act, actually do represent the world. Because what is clear is that they're very good at acting human. The open question in my mind is, is the easiest, most efficient, best way to act human to do the same things that human beings do? Or are there other ways? And I think that's an open question. I just heard a talk by Melanie Mitchell at Santa Fe Institute, a, an artificial intelligence researcher. And she told two stories um, about two different papers, one that someone else wrote and one that her group is following up on. And they were modeling Othello. Othello, the game with a little rectangular board, white and black squares. So the experiment was the following. They fed a neural network the moves that were being made in the most symbolic form, like E5 just means that, okay, you put a token down E5. So it gives a long string. It does this for millions of games, right? Real legitimate games. And then it asks the question, the paper asks the question, okay, you, you've trained it to tell what would be a legitimate next move from not a legitimate next move. Did it in its brain, in its little large language model brain, I don't even know if it's technically a large language model, but a deep learning network, did it come up with a representation of the Othello board? Well, how do you know? And so they construct a little probe network that they insert and you ask it, what is it doing right at this moment, right? And the answer is that uh, you know it, it, the, the little probe network can ask, you know, would this be legitimate or is, is this token white or black or whatever? Um, things that in, in practice would amount to it's invented the, the Othello board. And it found that um, the probe got the right answer not 100% of the time, but more than by chance, substantially more than by chance. So they said, there's some tentative evidence that this neural network has discovered the Othello board, just out of data, raw data, right? But then Melanie's group asked the question, okay, are you sure that that understanding of the, of the Othello board wasn't built into your probe? And what they found was like at least half of the improvement was built into the probe, you know, not all of it, right? And look, a Othello board is way simpler than the world. <laughs> so I, I, that's why I just, I just think it's an open question whether or not the, I mean, it would be remarkable either way to learn that large language models that are good at doing what we train them to do are good because they've built the same kind of model of the world that we have in our minds, or that they're good despite not having that model. Either one of these is an amazing thing. I just don't think the data are clear on which one is true. I, th I think uh, I have some sort of intellectual humility about the whole thing because I was humbled by several stages in the machine learning development over the past 20 years. And I was just would never have predicted that LLMs, the way they're trained, on the scale of data they're trained, would be as impressive as they are. Mm -hmm. And there, that's where intellectual humility steps in, where my intuition would say something like with Melanie, where you need to be able to have very sort of concrete, common sense reasoning, symbolic reasoning type things in a system in order for it to be very intelligent. But here, you're, I'm so impressed by what it's capable to do, train on the next token prediction, yeah. essentially. That's, I, I just, my conception of, of, of the nature of intelligence is just completely, uh, not completely, but uh, humbled, I should say. Look, and I think that's perfectly fair. I also um, was, I almost say pleasantly, but I don't know whether it's pleasantly or unpleasantly, but factually surprised by the recent rate of progress. Clearly some kind of phase transition percolation has happened, right? And the improvement has been remarkable, absolutely amazing. That I have no 
arguments with. I'm that doesn't yet tell me the mechanism by which that improvement happened. Constructing a model much like a human being would have is clearly one possible mechanism, but part of the intellectual humility is to say maybe there are others. I was chatting with the CEO of Anthropic, Dario Mede, so be behind Claude, and that company, but a lot, of, a, a lot of the AI companies are really focused on expanding the scale of compute. Sort of, if we assume that AI is not data limited, but is compute limited, you can make the system much more intelligent by using more compute. So let me ask you, on the almost on the physics level, do you think physics can help expand the scale of compute and maybe the scale of energy required to make that compute happen? Yeah, 100%. I think this is like one of the biggest things that physics can help with, and it's an obvious kind of low-hanging fruit situation where... Uh, the heat generation, the inefficiency, the waste of existing high-level computers is nowhere near the efficiency of our brains. It's hilariously worse. And we kind of haven't tried to optimize that hard on that frontier. I mean, your laptop heats up when you're sitting on your lap, right? It doesn't need to. Your brain doesn't heat up like, like that. Um, so clearly, there exists in the world of physics the capability of doing these computations with much less waste heat being generated, and I look forward to people doing that, yeah. Are you excited for the possibility of a nuclear fusion? I am cautiously optimistic, excited to be too strong. I mean, it'd be great, right? But if we really tried solar power, it would also be great. <laughs> so there, I, I think Elias Discover said this, that the future of humanity on Earth would be just, it, the entire surface of Earth is covered in solar panels and data centers. Why would you waste the surface of the Earth with solar panels? Put them in space. Sure, you can go in space, yeah. Space is bigger than the Earth. <laughs> yeah, just solar panels everywhere. Yeah. Just <laughs> I like it. We um, already have fusion. It's called the sun. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And, and there's probably uh, more and more efficient ways of catching that energy. Sending it down is the hard part, uh, absolutely. But yeah. um, that's an engineering problem, yeah. So I just wonder where the data centers, the compute centers can expand to, if that's the future. If AI is as effective as it promise, as it possibly could be, then it's the scale of computation will keep increasing. And perhaps it's a race between efficiency and, and uh, scale. There are constraints, right? You know, there's yeah. a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of damage we can do to the environment before it does not worth it anymore. So yeah, I think that's a new question. In fact, it's it's kind of frustrating because we get better and better at doing things efficiently, but we invent more things we want to do faster <laughs> than we get good at doing them efficiently. So we're continuing to make things worse in various ways. I mean, that's the, that's the dance of humanity where yeah. we're constantly creating uh, better, better, better technologies that are potentially causing a lot more harm and that includes for weapons, includes AI used as weapons, that includes nuclear weapons, of course, which is surprising to me that we haven't destroyed human civilization yet, given how many nuclear warheads are out there. Look, I'm with you. Between nuclear and bioweapons, uh, it is a little bit surprising that we haven't caused enormous devastation. Of course, we did drop two atomic bombs on Japan, but compared to what could have happened or could happen tomorrow, it could be much worse. Yeah. It does seem like there's an underlying, speaking of quantum fields, there's like a, like a, like a field of goodness within <laughs> the, the human heart that like in some kind of game theoretic way would create really powerful things that could destroy each other. And there's greed and ego and all this kind of power hungry dictators that are at play here in all the geopolitical landscape. But we somehow always like, don't go too far. Yeah, but that's exactly what you would say right before we went too right far. Right before we went too far. <laughs> and that's why we don't see aliens. <laughs>